Thank you to each one who took part in our service this morning. Thank you all for being here to study with us. We'll be in John chapter 21, verses 9 to 17, and considering fed to feed others. We're going to be looking at a breakfast here this morning. And many say breakfast is, is the most important meal of the day uh, in this day and age. And through much of history, the, the early meal, whether it was breakfast or lunch, was the larger meal and, and supper kind of small. We're kind of backwards of that today because they, they were working physically. They needed the strength and the energy to do what they needed to do. And that's what we're going to see in a spiritual way here today that, that Christ feeds us spiritually to enable us for the labors he has for us. So he, we are fed by Christ that we may then feed others after the example of Peter here. So I would ask you if you're able to please stand with me for the reading of God's word. John chapter 21 starting in verse 9. As soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid thereon and bread. Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, and hundred and fifty and three. And for all there were, not, there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And now the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them, and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. So when they had dined, Jesus saith unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the restoration we see here of Peter, Lord, because we know we need that in our lives oft times. Thank you for the love of Christ and the opportunity we have to love and serve him. Please guide me to speak only your truth in this time and take it to your heart to our hearts by your spirit. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So this morning we'll consider the creation of the meal, the call to the meal, and the command from the meal. Last week we considered the miraculous catch of fish. We saw the disciples, professional fishermen, who were powerless in their own strength when they were operating outside the will of God. But then when Christ came into the scene and directed them, they had an overwhelming catch of fish. And now coming after that, we have what's kind of a simple and, and very normal scene. They, they sit down to eat breakfast. But in it we see Christ's provision for us, and we see the opportunity we have to serve in light of what he has given us and done for us. And, and this is especially played out in the case of Peter that Peter's going to be restored after his denial of the Lord. He's going to re be restored back into service and, and really recommissioned. And, and that's what Christ desires to do in our lives when it is necessary. So we see the creation of the meal in verses 9 to 11. John 21, 9. As soon as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid thereon and bread. Remember, the disciples were at sea. Peter couldn't wait. He jumped out. He swam to shore to see the Lord. The rest of the disciples had to bring, somebody's got to bring the fish. So they bring the small boat, come to shore. They wait ashore, bring the net with them, and come to see Christ. But when they get to shore, not only do they see the Lord, but they see the solution to their most pressing problem. Remember, Jesus had asked them, have ye any meat? Which meant not only had they not caught anything, but they didn't even have breakfast. So here he has, their, as the hymn we sang, their, their, their greatest need in that moment was nourishment. And Christ has the solution. The fire of coals there and fish laid thereon and bread. Christ provided it all. He doesn't just have the ingredients. He doesn't just have the fire waiting for them. He has done it all. The fish, the fire, the bread. And, and some say oh, Christ miraculously did that. But in his earthly ministry, I don't think we ever see Christ miraculously do what could be done physically. He saves his miracles for what is impossible from human nature. So I'm inclined to believe that Jesus did this in the human way, that he took the time to, to gather some fish, 
to, to have bread, to, to build this fire. He took the time. How often does he take the time with us to, to work us and, and be patient with us? When we meet Christ, he will meet our needs. Even the most mundane thing to the fullest degree. And as we've looked before with the, the resurrected Christ, he's just there. And like Mary, so often he's there, but we're looking in every direction. But, but when we consider Christ and, and look to him for our needs, he is there to meet it. And just one interesting thing in this verse, the fire of coals. That specific descriptor, that specific word is used only one other place. It's back in John 18 at the scene of Peter's denial. When the Romans and the soldiers and everybody else at Herod's or at the high priest's palace, they were gathered around a fire of coals. So no doubt John is drawing that parallel, and no doubt as Peter approached the Lord, he saw that fire, and his conscience was panged by his denial of the Lord. But now this fire of coals is going to be the scene of his reconciliation. Verse 10, Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. He calls them, he says, yeah, you got 153 fish there. Bring some of them to put on the fire for the breakfast, to add, we see Jesus already had fish, he calls them to add to it. And that kind of prompted my mind, well, Jesus already has fish. He knew how many disciples there were. He, he no doubt could have caught as many and had as many as needed. So if he already has fish, why does he call them to bring some which they have caught? And notice he says that ye have now caught, drawing their attention that it's not from the catch of the night, it's, it's everything has happened just in this last catch. But Christ is doing this, I believe, to include them, to, to give them an opportunity to, to be part of, of the service, to be useful to Christ. It's not that they have really fundamentally contributed anything because all the fish they had caught, they were from Christ anyway. They, they couldn't catch anything in their own strength. So all the fish are from Christ, but he is giving the opportunity for the disciples to, to be part of it. Now, this is an important distinction. We, we can't add anything to our salvation, but as believers, as these disciples were, Christ calls on us to, to act and to serve. God's grace is never to produce sloth. He doesn't want to be gracious and care for us, so we just sit back and, and take it easy. As we're going to see with Peter here, he, he calls us in light of his grace to serve. So he wants to provide, but how often does he want us, he wants to provide for us through our own labors. I've said before, we pray, give us this day our daily bread, but in Scripture, God has revealed that by and large, he desires to meet that need through our daily labors. So Christ has provided everything. He provided all the fish there, but he has allowed the disciples to, to labor and be part of that provision. And it's a reminder to us that when we labor for the Lord, he accepts our service. He didn't say, well, my fish are better. I don't want your fish over there. How often we feel that, that we are, I mean, in, in pure conscience and, and serving the Lord with all our might, but how often do we feel our service is, is, is halting and, and imperfect? But we see from this that, that if we're doing it for the Lord, Christ accepts our service. Even if we don't think it's what we want it to be or ought to be, if we are truly doing it for the Lord, He accepts our service. Last week, we saw Christ call the disciples, and by extension us, to labor for him. That the catch of fish produced a lot of work, but he called them to do that labor. But we see here, we are blessed by the fruit of it. We are provided by through Christ, but he uses our labors to do that. So they took the fish that they had caught. Again, notice that just now. You have now caught he had no sooner brought the fish to them that he desires for them to put those fish to work. And, and that's the same with the blessings the Lord provides for us. He doesn't give us gifts or blessings and say, now sit on that for a while and then maybe you can use it sometime down the road. He says, now use what I have now given you. Whatever I've put in your pocket, whatever I've put in your hands, whatever I've enabled you to, do it now. Don't wait around, don't... don't Sit on it for a while. Whatever we've been gifted with, use it immediately. We want to be not a pool, but a clear channel. Last Sunday we sang channels only. 
Whatever Christ puts into our lives, we want to be a channel that it can flow through, that he may bless others by it. Verse 11, Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of fishes, 150 and three, and for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. And, and we looked at this verse last week. We saw the, the miraculous provision of the fish. We saw the miraculous power that Christ gave Peter to pull 600, maybe 1,000 pounds up onto that shore. We saw the miraculous protection of the net. But notice here that it's only after Christ has called them to bring of the fish that they count them. And this is another thing that the opportunity to, to use what Christ has given us to participate, that draws our attention to the specifics of what he has given. How often do we realize, I never thought I could do that until we're called upon to do it. I didn't know Christ had gifted me in that area until I was called to use it. So he calls us to, to participate, to use what he has gifted us with. And that is oftentimes how we count our blessings, how we realize the fullness when we are in the midst of using them. When Christ's blessings are applied to a need, that is where we see the great extent and, the, and we can appreciate it. And Christ has given this great catch of fish, and I think that's a picture, because that they're, they're calling to be disciples. Andrew, Peter, James, and John, what did Christ tell them? I'll make you fishers of men. And just as Christ is able to give them this catch of literal fish, Christ will not allow their ministry to be barren either. This catch of 153 fish, I think, is a picture of the catch that's coming here in, in a few days at Pentecost. When they are fishers of men and, and Peter will preach and 3,000 will come to know the Lord. So Christ is powerful to meet our physical needs and, and bring fruit of our labors, but he can do the same thing spiritually as well. And the catch of fish and, and the great provision and, and all that's associated with this verse here, that's the only miracle we see from the Lord post-resurrection. It's the only miracle we see him do after he rose. But it's important for us that God included at least one of those because it's a reminder, even though that's not his primary mode of operation, now it's by the word and it's by the, the, the testimony of the resurrection but Christ's hand is not slack. He is still a miracle-working God, and he still can and he still desires to work mightily on our behalf. So that is the creation of the meal. Christ has it all prepared, but he calls them, bring of what you have caught. He accepts their labor as well, their service to him. Secondly, in verses 12 to 14, the call to the meal. John 21, 12. Jesus saith unto them, come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? All the preparation has been made, and now there's the invitation to partake. Come and dine, and, and that word is important. It's dine as opposed to sup. In this day and age, they largely just had two meals. It was the, the, the early meal, dinner, dine, later meal, supper, sup. Come and have your breakfast. Come and break your fast is literally what it is saying. What Jesus is telling them is, get your strength from today from my provision. The labors that you're going to have to accomplish today, get the strength and preparation from that, for them from my provision. And, and what a blessing that, that is that Christ gives us what we need up front. Uh, I talked about this last week. That he doesn't say, if you work hard enough and if you're committed enough to me, at some point I'll give you a spiritual gift. At some point I will enable you. When we are saved, we, we, we have all we could need. We are baptized and indwelt with the Holy Spirit. We are given spiritual gifting. So Christ provides up front, if you will, he provides our breakfast and says labor in light of that. He doesn't call us to toil through the day and then I'll, I'll give you what you need at the end of the day. We toil and look forward to eternal reward at the end, but Christ gives us every provision we could need in the morning, if you will. We don't have it in John's gospel. In the other gospels, we have the Great Commission. He's going to tell his disciples, go ye into all the world, but he calls us, come and dine first. Yes, we need to go and preach the gospel and serve, and as we're going to see with Peter, feed his sheep, but first he says, come and dine. Don't neglect your personal provision. However much we serve, let us not neglect our personal devotion, our personal 
time with the Lord, that we might be fed of his word and fed in prayer, that we can then go feed others. That's the title, fed. We are fed first, that we may then feed others with that, with that which we have gotten from Christ. So he offers this to them, come and dine. And I want to look at, at a couple parallels here in the book of Revelation. First, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. This great evangelistic verse, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, this is Christ speaking, and if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. The invitation for Christ to dine with him, to have fellowship with him. But then look back at Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 to 9, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. That is the church, that is us who are saved. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine white linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. If you know Christ is your Savior, you are bidden to that supper. You're going to be at that supper. We have our dinner. We have our breakfast now with Christ to prepare us for the labors. That's the supper at the end. That is the consummation of, of, of all that we serve and do. The consummation of the ages then is to be there with Christ at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And just finally here, Revelation twenty two seventeen, A final invitation of Scripture. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. The provision of salvation that Christ offers, he says, come. He calls for us, but we must respond. We must receive it. But what a blessing we have to be able to dine and to sup with our Lord. And he offers, and it seems there's some, there's some hesitance here on the part of the disciples. And none of the disciples durst ask him, who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Before, when, when they were on the boat, they couldn't tell it was Jesus. And then only John perceived, and he told Peter. But now, as they come to the shore, they all know it's the Lord. They, they recognize him. They don't have to ask his identity. And it's interesting, the, the word there, knowing that it was the Lord, the, the Greek word oida, it's from the same root as the word idon. That's that word for seeing that we've looked at through several weeks. That they have seen with, with perception and faith and therefore they know it. Because of what they have perceived, they are able to behold it with understanding. Their sight of Christ brought full understanding and recognition of him. So they know it's the Lord, but, but it still seems like they're hanging back, that they want to ask something, but they know they shouldn't because they, they, they know it's the Lord. But it's a reminder to us to, to not ask what Christ ha has already revealed or has already answered, I should say. Maybe you haven't done it, but I know I've prayed about a situation and, and I've gotten the answer. And it wasn't the answer I wanted. And I just, maybe God will change his mind. I'll just, I'll just kind of keep banging away at it. Or, or we, we learn something from the Lord and, and maybe we don't like it. Once the Lord has revealed himself, don't, don't ask, don't seek further. Once you know what he wants you to know, then respond in light. Also, maybe sometimes we know there's a calling and we'd like a little more information on that. And Christ is not going to answer that this time. Christ says, go. So these disciples, they, they had questions on their mind, but they knew now was not the time to ask. Just like us, Christ, when needed, he will increase our faith. He will reveal what is needed for, to lead us to the next step, but he does not satisfy curiosity. And we need to make sure that we're making that distinction when we ask things of him. Verse 13, Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise. The disciples are, are kind of hanging back, it seems, a little bit. And Christ takes the initiative. He takes the bread. He takes the fish off. And just like at the Last Supper, Christ has the role of, of the householder, the, the, the one who's in charge. He would be the one to, to, to break and pass the, the food around and, and have the host. He distributes the food to them, the bread and the fish, 
And that draws my mind to, to the feeding of the 5,000, how Christ break them and, and pass them around. And at that point, the disciples were the servers. They were taking the food around. Here they are the recipients and able to dine with the Lord. And we don't see Christ eating here, uh, but, and we're not sure if, or if he ate with them or not, but we do know, we, we learn a little bit of something for, of the resurrection body from Luke chapter 20, 24, verses 41 to 43. And this is uh, when Christ met the disciples in the upper room. Verse 41, And when they believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and of a an honeycomb, and he took it and did eat before them. So that's just an affirmation that Christ was not just resurrected spiritually, he was resurrected physically, he was able to handle and eat things, and it speaks to us, I think our resurrection bodies will match Christ. We're told we've got a marriage supper to go to, so we are going to be able to eat in our resurrection bodies, not because we need to, but just out of the, the joy and, and the pleasure and the fellowship of a meal. So Christ distributes the food to them. This, now, this is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. So this is a little bit of a, a recap of, of what has happened in this chapter to this point. Jesus showed himself, or, or again, the, the idea, he was manifested. He revealed himself in order to teach something about himself. He revealed himself to his disciples to teach them that he was not done with them, that he still had a calling upon their lives, that he would provide for them if they would serve then in obedience. The third time, each time they gain a little more understanding. The first time he, he appeared to the disciples without Thomas and they realized that he was resurrected. But then when Thomas was there, we, we see more, we see that great proclamation, my Lord and my God. And so they were spiritually encouraged then, but now in this third time we see Christ affirm to them, okay, I'm not done with you. I've got a plan for you. This is what you all need to do. But notice, he showed himself after he was risen from the dead. The resurrection is an inescapable fact of Scripture. You cannot take out, you cannot spiritualize the resurrection without totally casting aside the Bible. Jesus physically raised from the dead, and, and we've talked about this phrasing before, it's literally raised from among the dead. Jesus was counted among the dead, and then he was raised up, and the rest of the dead remain. That's the same thing that the Bible describes at the rapture. It's not just that the dead are raised, but it's that believers are raised from among the dead. The rest of the dead will sleep then for another thousand and seven years. So we will be resurrected just like Christ was. And what a joyous thing that is. And now finally, and our longest point here, the command from the meal in verses 15 to 17. We've Christ, seen Christ, he prepared everything, he served, he gave the disciples all they needed. Now what does he want from them? And specifically in the person of Peter. John 21, 15. So when they had dined, Peter saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. They've finished eating. The, the disciples, their needs have been met. They are satisfied. And now Christ talks privately with Peter. And, and in verse 20, it describes John as following after them, so I, I, I think they got up and Christ and Peter are kind of strolling along the seashore here and, and talking privately one with another. Peter, the spokesman time and again for the disciples, the one that is, is always eager and ready to say something. But remember, he has denied the Lord. He publicly denied even knowing who the Lord was. And Christ had spoken with Peter already. He had a he appeared after the resurrection specifically to Peter. And I think in that time Christ made clear to Peter that that he was forgiven. He knew the remorse of Peter's heart and and the relationship was mended there. But it seems Peter he still felt unfit for further service. Remember, he, he knows the Lord is resurrected, and Jesus had told him, so send I you. And Peter said, I go fishing. Maybe Jesus can use somebody else, but I, I know I'm saved. I know the resurrected Lord, but I'll go back to my fishing nets. Surely 
surely he can't use me. I'm, I've blown it. I'm, I'm too damaged to use. But here we see Christ restore him. Peter, Peter believed he, he, he lost his opportunity. He could worship the Lord, he could live for the Lord, but surely he was not going to be able to, to be a, a, a spokesman, a servant of the Lord like he was before. And maybe some of you feel that way. Maybe you say, I, I've done these things for the Lord, but this has come into my life and I just, I'm too broken. This has happened to me or, or I just, I can't do it anymore. The Lord, the Lord can't use me. But I think just like he's going to do to Peter, the Lord desires to restore you not only to a place of fellowship, but to a place of usefulness. But he speaks to him, Simon, son of Jonas. And it's interesting, this is, it's a very, it's a very specific and almost a, a formal form of identification. I mean, it's, it's like you walking up to your best friend and calling them by their first and last name. It's, it's interesting, but, but Christ is, wants to make no mistake of who this is. He, he, and I think but he, he's really getting a hold of Peter's attention here. And notice what he calls him. Simon. He doesn't call him Peter. Because Peter's not acting like a rock. Remember, Christ gave him the, the name Peter, Cephas, because he was, he was a little rock. But Peter's, not, P- Peter's kind of gone back to his old ways. He's gone back to his nets. So, so the Lord calls him Simon, his human nature, if you will. He asks, Simon, do you love me? Lovest thou me more than these? And I'm sure many of you know as we look this love, we're looking at the word love a lot in these three verses. There's going to be two different Greek words here. The one Christ uses here is agapeo, or, or you probably know it as agape. Agape love. That is God's perfect, selfless love. Agape love is not a feeling. It is an act of will. It is a choice to put somebody first, to love them, to seek their best interest. And when Christ says it, does he, he says, do you love me more than these? It's in the present tense. Peter, do you constantly love me? Does love for me characterize your life? But we don't want to miss the second part of that more than these. And it kind of leads us, well, who are these? And it may be that that Christ is speaking of the fish, this, this giant catch of fish. Do you love me more than these fish? That, I mean, you could sell, you could start your business up and be in good shape. Do you love me more than being a fisherman? Do you love me more than your old life? Or will you give up all of this being a fisherman? And will you come back to, to being a fisher of men for me? So that's a possibility. The second possibility is Christ is speaking of the other disciples who are there. Do you love me more than these other disciples? And maybe that's drawing Peter back to Matthew chapter 26, verse 33, when he's making his boast that, Lord, all else might abandon you, but I will never leave you. He's saying all you other disciples might run, but I'm never going to. In that he's saying, I love Jesus more than anybody else does. And perhaps the Lord, the Lord is the master of the words. Maybe he had both of these things in mind. Peter, who had claimed that he loved the Lord more than anybody else, that he would go to death with the Lord, he had denied the Lord. And in doing so, for a time, Peter felt he took himself out of service. He was no longer able or or, uh, he had no longer earned being the Lord's disciple, a spokesman for him. But the Lord isn't done with Peter. The Lord wants to recommission him here. So he says, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me enough to serve me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Peter says, Yes, I I love the Lord. And and that should be all, all of our testimony, that we love the one who died for us. And he says, Lord, you know, you know my heart. You don't have to ask me things. But as we've looked at many times, when the Lord asks a question, it's not because he needs to know, it's because he's drawing somebody's attention to it. The Lord knows Peter's emotions, his, Peter's feelings, Peter's act of will, but he wants Peter to understand and to realize it. But when Peter says, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love you, he uses his different 
Greek word. He uses phileo. That, that's brotherly love. And there's kind of a whole range of interpretations on using these two words. There's some that say, well, it's basically stylistic, that they, they mean the same thing and there's no real difference here. And, and those are especially people that, that don't like to use the, the, the Greek and, and, and say if it's translated the same, we should go with that. And then there's some on the other end that, that just put them miles apart and that Peter's basically saying, yeah, I'm kind of fond of you, Lord. And, and I, I don't think that's the case. I think because the Holy Spirit led the use of different words here, that there's some distinction there, but I don't want to because people usually use that to, to bash Peter, that I, I, I'm not sure the difference is as great as it's often made out to be. And I'd like to look at a few uses of phileo in John to see how he uses this word, and, and that it's not just being fond of, that it's truly love, but, but maybe just not quite where Christ is saying. So turn with me, if you would, to John 5.20. John chapter 5 and verse 20. For the Father loveth the Son. That, that's phileo, it's not agape. The Father loveth the Son. God loves Christ in this same way and showeth him all the things that he himself doeth and that he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. So God can love with phileo love. John 11, at the tomb of Lazarus, verse 3. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. So Jesus loved with phileo love. Uh, Verse 36 of John 11. And then said the Jews, behold how he loved him. And that's in response to Christ weeping at the tomb. So we cannot just cast phileo love aside in John's gospel as run of the mill, I'm kind of fond of you. This is, this is a deep-seated love that Peter has, but, but what phileo love is it more draws the relationship of it. Peter Peter avoids using the same word that Christ used, and I think because his... His brashness has been quelled. He, he knows his limitations now. Peter doesn't want to, to offer more than he knows he can give. So he, he doesn't speak in the term of God's love, but Christ, I, I love you as much as I can know how in a relationship with you. But notice what he does not say. He just says, yea, I love you. He doesn't say more than these. Again, Peter who before the death of Christ could say, yeah, if anybody else, everybody else can, can deny you, Lord, can run away, I won't. Peter knows he did deny his Lord. So he, he's not going to go out on a limb and say, Lord, I love you more than anybody else. But he's just going to say, Lord, I do love you. You know that I do love you. He's not going to set himself above anyone else. He said unto him, feed my lambs. So in light of this affirmation of love, Christ gives Peter a command. And that's why I think many commentators are too harsh on Peter that they say, oh, he's just saying, I'm, I'm fond of you, Lord. Because Peter doesn't rebuke him. He, Peter, Christ receives that love and, and he gives Peter a command. But in affirmation of this love, he, he tells Peter, feed my lambs. And this shows us the primary prerequisite for service to the Lord. It's to love the Lord. It's not to have X years of Bible education. It's not to have been a Christian for this long. It's not to have this spiritual gifting. It's not to have these talents. It is to love the Lord. And friend, if you love the Lord, you can serve Christ and he will use you in a great and mighty way. You may say, I, I don't have the skill set. I can't do it. Well, what have we looked at? Christ offers us to dine with him. He offers the strength for the day physically and spiritually, to do what he calls us to do. He has given us everything. So we, and so often we think we're being humble if we say, oh, I, I couldn't be up front like that or I couldn't do that. I'm, God has given us different gifts. So there's, but, but when we say, I, I can't serve the Lord in a great way, he, I, I can't do very much, we think we're being humble. But what we're really doing is spitting in the face of Christ because we're saying, you didn't give me enough to do this. We say, I can't, if the Lord calls us and we say, I can't do that, what we're really saying is, Lord, you didn't help me enough. You didn't give me enough to do that. And A, that's a lie because if he calls us, we know he has given us what we need. And, and B, it's an insult to him. It's often been said that Christ qualifies the called. He does not call the qualified. He does not seek to use us because of who we are and what we bring to the table. He will give us what we need because he has called us. If we will obey, he will give us everything we need to serve with the prerequisite that we love him. If we love the Lord enough, 
the Lord who died for us, the Lord who saves us, if we love him, then we will obey and step out and do what he asks us to do. So he accepts Peter's love. It's not lacking. And he commands him then to service. Feed my lambs. Let's turn back to John chapter 10 and look at the lambs of Christ. John chapter 10, verse 11. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Verse 16, and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. These sheep, these lambs, these are those who are Christ. Christ is the good shepherd. Those who believe in him by faith are his sheep. Christ is the good shepherd, but he calls Peter, and by extension all ministers of the gospel, pastors, etc. He calls us to be his under-shepherds, to feed, to care for the sheep. Spiritually, first and foremost, but also there, there can be a physical aspect of the care. Let's look at this in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. This is Paul's final instruction to the, the elders of the church at Ephesus when he's leaving and knowing he will not see them again. Acts 20, 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. So the minister is over a flock, a congregation, a local body of believers to feed them with the word. And this flock is made up of those who have been purchased by the blood of Christ, who have received his forgiveness. Feed, just like love, is in the present tense. This isn't just one great task that Christ has for Peter to do and be done with. This is going to be a lifelong commissioning to feed the sheep. Keep on feeding. Christ has called him away from fishing and being a fisherman. He's called him to feeding and being a a shepherd, a spiritual commissioning. He's called him to a life's work. But as we go in verses 16 and 17, the command will be to feed my sheep. Here it is, feed my lambs. These are specifically the, the little lambs, the, the tender little babies, the young believer. Feed them with the word that first those that Christ know are part of the flock, but they haven't believed yet, to, to preach the word to them, that they might come to faith in Christ, and then to nurture them with the word that they may spiritually grow. Many people who elevate Peter, uh, the Catholic Church, and others that, that say that he's some kind of primate of the church, they see here Christ is setting him up as he's the top dog. But I think really Christ is saying, Peter, you're a, you know what it's like to fail. You know what it's like to be weak. You're the right man to take care of these smallest of the flock. Care for these tender little ones that they may grow and be strengthened. And this is especially important for Peter. As I said, all pastors are, are called to feed the sheep, to shepherd. But Peter, especially because in Christ talking about the flock back there in chapter 10, he said, I have other sheep. That was the Gentiles, that he was going to bring the Jew and Gentile together in one flock. And Peter was the one with the keys to do that first. He sent the gospel to the Jew at Pentecost, and then he was the one who went to the house of Cornelius and first took the gospel to the Gentiles. So Peter has a special place in time that, that he was key at, at, that, at the formation of the church, but he did not have any special authority over anyone else other than that, any more than, than any other pastor does. But so Peter is commissioned to feed the sheep. And this idea of a shepherd caring for the people as his flock, this is one that, that's, that's rooted in the Old Testament, rooted in Judaism. And, and Peter, of course, would have known this. And Christ is calling him to be a good shepherd, following after the good shepherd, the chief shepherd, who is Christ, in contrast to those who had failed before. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Ezekiel. We'll be in Ezekiel chapter 34.
Look with me at Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 2 through 4. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. That was the political and religious leaders who had turned their back on God and gone after their own things. The shepherds of Israel prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? Ye eat the fat, and ye clothe you with the wool. Ye kill them that are fed, but ye feed not the flock. The diseased have ye not strengthened, neither have ye healed that which was sick, neither ye have bound up that which, which was broken, neither have ye brought again that which was driven away, neither have ye sought that which was lost, but with force and with cruelty have ye ruled them. The, the spiritual, the religious, and the physical, political leaders of Israel, they had sought their own. They had raised taxes and they had basically got all they could for their ministry, whereas their role before God was to care for the people under them. They had fed, they had, at the expense of the people, had gained the wealth, like a shepherd who eats the sheep's meat, is clothed with their wool, but refuses to take care of the flock. So in contrast to them, Peter's called to be a good shepherd who feeds the sheep. Well, if we look down at verses 30 and 31 of Ezekiel chapter 30, Thus shall they know that I am the Lord their God and with them, and that they, even the house of Israel, are my people, saith the Lord God, and ye my flock, and the flock of my pasture are men, and I am your God, saith the Lord God. So ultimately, God is their shepherd. The Father is the shepherd of Israel. Christ is the shepherd of the church. So anybody who, who shepherds, who is a pastor, we are under shepherds to the great shepherd, which is Christ. So we... As in all things, we should follow his example of being the good shepherd. Rather than seeking to enrich himself from the bounty of the flock, who's willing to lay down his life for the benefit of the sheep and the benefit of the flock. So Christ here, he has a job for Peter to do. And I can tell you, friend, if you have your faith in Christ Jesus, he has a job for you to do. He calls Peter to feed my lambs. He's calling him to a pastoral role. Friend, there are many open pulpits in good churches today, and I have no doubt that God has not called people, but I'm afraid we have men who refuse to answer the call. I don't know what call is upon your life. The Lord is calling you to full-time service, to pastoral ministry, to, to missions, but I pray if that is the call upon your life that you would not reject the Lord, that you would answer that call. And of course, He doesn't need to use this in a full-time way. He could be calling you in some other way. But he's calling you to feed his sheep. He's calling you to serve the church, to serve other believers. I know that Christ has a desire for you. He had commissioned Peter. He had already told him, I will make you a fisher of men. He said, so send I you. And it's not Christ that took Peter out of service. It's Peter that took him out. First, he, he, he took himself out with his sin in denial of the Lord, but, but now he, he knows he's forgiven of that, but, but he still feels, well, I'm not worthy. I'm, I'm not qualified. So Peter, he took himself out. And likewise, the only way that we'll be out of the service of the Lord is if we take ourselves out. And maybe we do that in sin and make no mistake that if we are in sin, that, that we need to confess that and, and see it as God sees it and gets that right. But, but after we are forgiven, we are restored and, and able to do that. Don't continue in your sin or don't look back and say, well, I've done this, God's done with me. He desires to recommission you. We take ourselves out, but God desires for us to be back in service. He looks at us as we sit and, and he calls for us and desires for us to do the job that he has for us to do. He wants us to be back in the game. I think of, uh, I guess it's 25 years ago, the, the Rams were in the Super Bowl against the, the Tennessee Titans. And the, the Rams, with less than two minutes, they, they had scored and they were up by a touchdown, but then the, the Titans were moving the ball. And the Rams on defense, the, 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 the culmination of their season, less than a minute to go, the, the last drive, and one of the defensive linemen taps his helmet and he runs the sideline and said, yeah, put somebody in for me. I'm out. And there's a famous clip, the head coach, Dick Vermeil, he said, you went out of the game with 26 seconds to go? But how often are we like that to Christ? I hear so much of people assured that Christ must be coming soon and there are no signs for the rapture we don't know when he's coming but if you are convinced that, that the return of Christ is near how can you not be serving 
How can you stand before the Lord and say, hey, I need a breather, I'm out. And the Lord says, you want out at this stage in the game? You're going to pull yourself out when there's so much to be done, when the harvest is ripe? Friend, don't be that person. Don't look, where's my backup? Christ has the job for you. Don't pull yourself out. We might need to let go of something. We might need to seek forgiveness. We need to follow where the Lord leads. But, but friend, don't just say somebody else will take care of it. Don't say I'm, I'm out of usefulness. The Lord wants to use you. Feed my lambs. He asked Peter, do you love me? And then he gives him some instruction. The way we show our love to the Lord is in service to him and love for believers. Christ, he asked Peter, and he listens to Peter's answer, but he's not as concerned with his words as he is with Peter's deeds. Because Peter says a lot of words before. And of course, Christ knows the heart. But he's concerned, Peter, in light of your love for me, are you going to act? Are you going to serve me? Are you going to care for the flock? Verse 16, he saith to him again, the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, loveth thou me? And he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. And these three verses feel repetitive, but there's subtle differences each time. Christ asks again, he's specific, he's direct. He drops the comparison. I'm not going to ask you, do you love me more than anybody else? But Peter, do you love me? Again, agape. Peter gives the exact same response. Yes, Lord. And notice as he says he loves him, he acknowledges him as Lord of his life. If we're going to love Christ, he needs to be Lord and master of every aspect of our life. He says, yes, Lord, you know that I love thee. And again, Peter uses phileo. He says, I know I love you with all I can, but I'm not confident to, to go to God's level of love. But Peter promises all the love he can muster. And Christ tells him, feed my sheep. So obviously there, there's a difference, it's sheep instead of lambs, but feed is actually a different word than it was in, in verses 15 or than it is in verse 17. That word is more literally feed, to graze. This word really means to shepherd. It's a broader word, not only to feed, but to lead, to, to protect, to discipline the sheep. And here sheep, it's not just the little lambs, it's, it's, it's a more broad term, the, the whole flock. Peter, you're not just concerned with the little, the new ones, you're concerned with with everybody who names the name of Christ. And I find it very interesting that the, the young ones need fed, the old ones need led. How often maybe there's a young believer and we're ready to, we're trying to straighten them out and get them headed right. What, what a new believer needs most is just to be fed on the word of God. It's the old ones that need the discipline. It's the old ones that need the rod and need straightened out a little bit. Sometimes we get that backwards. But don't only give the gospel to those that, that are young and need it. That as a believer, all our life we need to know more of the word, the meat of the word. We need to grow. We need to train and disciple. And, and God may not call you to, to, to shepherd a congregation, but I am sure there is somebody or some people in your life that he has called you to shepherd. Whether it's children of your household, whether it's just somebody that you are connected with that you can disciple, Christ wants you to share the word with them, and he wants you to, to be a partner, to hold them accountable, and to lead, and direct, and correct them when needed. And that's not always fun and popular, but it is necessary. Open your heart to who the Lord would have you to shepherd. Protect them from the wolves, the, the false teachers, the wrong paths. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 19 and verse 15. We're, we're not out of the woods as far as uh, false teachers and bad shepherds like Israel. Jude 12 warns us about that, feeding themselves without fear. There's false teachers still today that are consuming from the flock and not feeding the flock. And we need to be wary of that. But in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 15, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and that he should smite the nations, and he should rule them. That word rule is the same word as shepherd here. 
Christ is going to shepherd the earth with a rod of iron when he comes. So shepherding is not always nice, gentle, leading along by a pat of the hand. Sometimes shepherding is hard and gets a little rough. But if a sheep's wandering down the path that leads off the cliff, sometimes you've got to get a hold of it and bring it back. And sometimes we need to be willing to speak that hard word to a friend, to a loved one, to a brother in Christ, to bring them back towards the Lord. Verse 17, he saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. Christ asked the third time, and this time Christ asks, he uses Peter's word, phileo. Peter, do you phileo me? And again, I, I don't, some people say, Jesus is asking, Peter, do you even like me? And I don't think Christ is rebuking him in quite that way, but Peter, or Christ is accommodating himself to, to what Peter feels he can give. So Christ desires to call him, but he realizes he's going to need to lead Peter along. So he, he meets Peter at this point where he is. Peter, do you love me? And this grieved Peter, not only because he used phileo now, but, but because he had, had to ask him three times if he loved him. And no doubt this brought to Peter's mind that he had denied his Lord three times. And he, he feels that he needs to convince the Lord that, yes, I do love you. You know this. It seems like Peter, that it seems like Christ doubts this, but Peter says, Lord, you know all things. Christ knows our thoughts. He knows our motivations. And he knows the love that Peter has for him. Peter is no longer boastful in words. He's not going to say, yes, Lord, I love you more than anybody else does. He, he's not going to say, Lord, I know I love you as much as you love me. But he loves the Lord. And the way Peter's going to show that, it, it's not so much in his, Lord, I know I love you. It's going to be in Peter's actions. John chapter 15 and verse 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Peter was going to do that. Peter was going to be martyred. Peter was going to lay down his life for the Lord. That's how you show you love the Lord. We might never be called to be a martyr, but how we show we love the Lord is not because we wear a big badge that says, I love Jesus. Not because we say, yeah, I love the Lord. Especially not saying, I love the Lord more than so-and-so, but it's that we serve Him. Yes, we should proclaim to others that we love the Lord, but if it does not match our actions, then that's it's no good. Peter was going to be faithful and feed the Lord's sheep. Again, Christ reiterates it the third time. Feed, the word from verse 15, the, the, just the feeding with the word. And then the sheep from verse 16, feed all the congregation with the word. That feeding with the word is the primary job of a shepherd, uh, of a pastor. There are many other things, but all of that is secondary to the proclamation of the word. In 2 Timothy Chapter 4 and verse 2, the last chapter of Paul's last letter, what is the thing he tells Timothy, a young pastor, to do? Preach the word. There is nothing that will change hearts like the word of God can. Yes, we are supposed to help those in need. We are supposed to come alongside those that are hurting. But first and foremost, for each and every one of us, is to share the word of God. We may not all be called to a pulpit. We may not all be called to a congregation. But we are called to shepherd and to care for Christ's sheep. And he has somebody for you. There's a hymn I learned of just a, a couple weeks ago called Something to Do. And the words spoke to me, and I pray they will to you as well. There's a work for the hand. There's a work for the heart. Something to do, something to do. And each should be busy performing his part. There's something for all to do. There's work for the aged and work for the young. There's work for us all and excuses for none. There's work for the feeble and work for the strong. There's something for all to do. The third verse. The master says work and has shown us the way. Something to do, something to do. He says not tomorrow, the time is today. There's something for all to do. Again, there's work for the aged. There's work for the young. There's work for us all and excuses for none. There's work for the feeble and work for the strong. There's something for all to do. Friend, we've got something to do. We've seen the creation of the meal that Christ prepares what we need. He takes responsibility for what is required. 
We've seen the call to the meal. He invites us to have all our needs met by him, but then there's the commissioning from the meal that he calls us in light of that to go serve him. Friend, Christ gives us all that we need. First and foremost, he gives us salvation, which we cannot earn, but by his death and resurrection, if we put our faith in him, he will save us. But then Christ gives us the opportunity to serve in light of what he has given us. And yes, we're more like Peter than we'd like to admit. We often maybe even deny the Lord. We often stumble, but God forgives. God wants to restore you to fellowship and to usefulness. He wants you to serve him. There is something to do. The condition is not your age. It's not your health. It is not your physical ability. It's not even what you think you can do. The condition is to love the Lord. If you do that, you will respond to what he wants you to do. He will enable you to love him more than the things of this world. Friend, I ask you, does the Lord need to ask if you love him? He would look at your life. Would he have to say, where's your focus? Do you really love me more than these things? Do you love the Lord more than anything else? Do your actions show that? Have you loved him enough to trust him with your eternity in this matter of salvation? Do you love him enough to serve him, whatever that may entail? Even if it calls you to quit your job and go into the ministry, if it calls you to move, calls you to take some great step of faith, do you love him enough to answer yes to his call? Are you trusting in not your own strength, but in his provision alone? Serving because he has given you what you need. Maybe there's one here that you have served greatly and now you feel you're out. You've sidelined yourself. Friend, there's work for you to do. Will you seek restoration with the Lord and will you help feed his sheep? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the example of Peter. Even in his frailness, Lord, we can relate to him. But Lord, we thank you that you restored him. We thank you that you provide our every need, physical and spiritual. And that what you have called us to do, you will also equip us for. But Lord, we know you call us. Over all these things of life, you call us. You first call us to yourself to receive salvation, but then you call us to yourself to go out and serve. Lord, please speak to our hearts and help us see how you desire for us to serve. If there's one here, maybe you're calling them to to vocational ministry and the pastorate as a missionary, Lord, please speak to them. Help them to not put this off, but to, to say yes to your call in their life. But to each of us, Lord, however you would call us to serve, please lay that upon our hearts and, and help us to answer yes. Lord, please help us to see who is our flock. Who do we have an opportunity to, to shepherd, to, to lead for you? Bring that to mind and help us to faithfully, faithfully do that, Lord. We thank you for the strength and power you will give and the calling you place on us for the opportunity to serve you. We love you, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord has placed something on your heart. Uh, somebody that you know you need to lead for the Lord. Somebody, some, some area of service. The altar is open. Not, not, that that, not that you can't speak to God where you are, but, but that is such a powerful affirmation. To, to go and say publicly, yes, Lord, I will do this as Denny leads us.